thanks so much for joining us this morning. We are thrilled to see you once again. In Davos, welcome to this morning's panel. Um, hosted by the Fox Business Network, I'm Maria Bartiromo. And we gather here today to talk about global markets in a fractured world. And of course, we are living in a fractured world uh, with major changes happening throughout the Middle East, Africa, Europe, the United States, Latin America. When you consider the changes taking place specifically in the Middle East as we speak from a corruption crackdown in Saudi Arabia to an uprising of the people in Iran and to terrorists around now on the run. In Europe, we are awaiting Brexit and the solutions and conclusions there. We are watching new leadership in places like France, as well as uh, throughout Europe, as well as uh, in the coming years and months in Latin America. And of course, the United States and what new leadership means for trade, for unity across the world. We have changes in government regulation and the major impact that it is having on business, as well as individuals everywhere. The uncertainty abounds, and yet we are here watching global markets continue to rise at levels never seen before. It's pretty incredible. In the US, the Dow Jones Industrial Average has hit some 80 new highs in the, over the last year. And for the first time in a long time, we are seeing synchronized global growth, with expectations of 4% growth now for 2018. In Europe, we're seeing growth, 2%. The emerging markets also watching for growth. So what will 2018 bring in the face of all of this? Let me welcome our distinguished panel, some of the leading voices in business across the world. Joining us right now is Adina Friedman. She is the CEO of NASDAQ, the chairman, founder, and CEO of the Blackstone Group, Steve Schwarzman. Brian Moynihan, the CEO of Bank of America. Tijan, uh, uh, Tijan the CEO of... Again. In Davos, welcome to this morning's panel. Um, hosted by the Fox Business Network, I'm Maria Bartiromo. And we gather here today to talk about global markets in a fractured world. And of course, we are living in a fractured world uh, with major changes happening throughout the Middle East, Africa, Europe, the United States, Latin America. When you consider the changes taking place specifically in the Middle East as we speak, from a corruption crackdown in Saudi Arabia to an uprising of the people in Iran and to terrorists around now on the run. In Europe, we are awaiting Brexit and the solutions and conclusions there. We are watching new leadership in places like France, as well as uh, throughout Europe, as well as uh, in the coming years and months in Latin America. And of course, the United States and what new leadership means for trade, for unity across the world. We have changes in government regulation and the major impact that it is having on business as well as individuals everywhere. The uncertainty abounds and yet we are here watching global markets continue to rise at levels never seen before. It's pretty incredible. In the US, the Dow Jones Industrial Average has hit some 80 new highs in the, over the last year. And for the first time in a long time, we are seeing synchronized global growth with expectations of 4% growth now for 2018. In Europe, we're seeing growth, 2%. The emerging markets also watching for growth. So what will 2018 bring in the face of all of this? Let me welcome our distinguished panel, some of the leading voices in business across the world. Joining us right now is Adina Friedman. She is the CEO of NASDAQ, the chairman, founder, and CEO of the Blackstone Group, Steve Schwarzman. Brian Moynihan, the CEO of Bank of America. Tijan, uh, uh, Tijan the CEO of Credit Suisse. Tijan Tiam, I'm sorry, Tijan. Okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, the CEO of Deutsche Post, Frank Appel, joining us. Great to see everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Steve, let me kick it off with you. Can you explain that, what's happening in the world today, and why global markets seem to ignore some of these really big issues like North Korea uh, and uncertainty throughout Asia as well? Well, it's, it's, it's a time of enormous uh, ebullience, in effect, part of which is, is created by really good economic growth. And markets 
have responded, and people mostly look at uh, markets. Uh, for those of us who live in the real world, um, the real world is doing really quite well. And, and so people, uh, you know, sort of surprisingly have, have assumed there's like no risk out there. And, and, and that's because they're looking through the lens uh, of economics uh, and from the perspective of just, you know, the way the world's supposed to play out. You know, if the central banks don't raise interest rates uh, too fast, which they won't, because um, they're not looking to create an economic slowdown, because inflation's pretty low, they're all, all these people are right. The only problem is there are these other lurking geopolitical risks uh, all over the place and sort of tribalism uh, and all kinds of things that nobody wants to uh, miss the party, if you will. Uh, because the party is really so good. They're serving wonderful food and drink, and you know, you're making money, and it's not real hard work. Uh, but uh, there, there will uh, come a reckoning at some point uh, when some of these other problems aren't uh, fully contained. So I think that's what's going on. Well, what we want to really identify are some of the risks out there uh, that we should be watching, Brian Moynihan. Let, let's talk about what it is out there that could be lurking, that could change this otherwise feel-good story in terms of uh, economic growth globally. Well, I think, as Steve said, you have a very constructive economic uh, backdrop. Everybody predicts uh, world growth to grow year over year. Everybody predicts, especially the United States, to grow at a faster pace with some of the things that have gone on with tax reform and regulatory reform. So. That construct is good. And then the real question is, what's going to stop the consumers in Europe and the United States and other markets from spending? And their confidence is up. The unemployment levels you know, are touching 4% in the US and are lows, uh, 20, 30, 40-year lows around the world in various places. And so that's really what's going to drive it. And so when, the, when is a consumer going to quit spending when they're worried about having a job and getting paid? And you don't see that right now, but it gets down to the question of when they're employers or when they feel their employers are going to take a different approach. And that's going to be uh, when you see some of those parade of uh, things that you talked about earlier, uh, something break the wrong way. And right now, the market shrugged off the ones that break the wrong way, whether it's a government shutdown, whether it's potential conflict in various parts. The markets have shrugged it off. But at some point, the markets may retract, uh, withdraw and st stop shrugging it off. And that's what we're worried about. When you think about central banks, uh, they have no desire, as Steve said, to do anything to slow this down in a way that would be inappropriate. So I think you should expect that they'll be very uh, accommodative uh, far into next year. We've got headlines this morning where we're going to see new tariffs on washing machine imports into the United States, as well as solar panels. Uh, we want to wait to see what the uh, response is from China. But I know trade and, and interest rates and inflation are among the worries. Tijen, take us to Europe. I know you've been watching and studying and, and working in Europe for some time, for, for, for the first time in a long time. We're talking about growth in Europe right now. How would you characterize the situation there? Uh, I think it's one of the key changes that have happened uh, recently. If you look at the world economy, uh, the, the power and the strength of the US economy are well known. That's not new. Um, the China story is not new. I think the, the change in 17 and 18 has been the change in Europe. With France um, coming back, I think we'll have President Macron here. Uh, I've always said France is a battleground of reform in Europe. Germany, again, it's not new. It's a very powerful economy. It's always done well, will do well. It doesn't have a government. hasn't had one for four months. Nobody seems to notice or, or care. So France is really the, the place where, um, where things are happening. I mean, the labor reforms there are, are very positive. So um, all that backdrop is, is very positive. I mean, trade. We've all worried about trade recently because actually um, in the last two, three years, trade grew more slowly than world GDP, which, is, which was very worrying. The good news in 17 is that again, trade started growing faster than world GDP. So, I mean, this new uh, decision on solar panels and washing machines, yeah, is that the recent decision, is a, is a first move. We will need to see how it impacts um, global trade, how other blocks Trading blocks react to that. But I remain optimistic. I, I think we are in an exceptionally favorable context that we haven't had in, I mean, the IMF said in seven years. I, I think it's more than that, where you have the US, as you said in your introduction, synchronous growth with the US doing well, China doing well, Europe doing well. I think the French 
Uh, I just met Governor of Banque de France recently. France has kept upgrading its 2017 growth, uh, GDP growth uh, expectations. Well, it's 1.7 now at 1.9%. And consumer confidence, to your point, Boren, is very strong, which is really driving, driving growth. So very, very positive backdrop. Yeah, it, it seems all very positive. Adina, let's talk about uh, what you're seeing out there. Obviously, you're, you're talking with a, a, a global population uh, listing at, at NASDAQ. How do you see it? Well, there uh, is definitely a pent-up demand for companies that are looking to go public. And I think that the last couple of years have been disappointing in terms of seeing companies actually take to the public markets, but we did see a nice pickup in the latter half of 2017. And right now we have uh, a very nice pipeline of companies looking to tap the public markets in 18. And I think it's actually very global in nature in terms of the types of companies that are coming to market. Um, and whether they're coming to the US or they're coming to other major market centers, I think that you're seeing um, companies that feel that they're ready, they're mature enough, the backdrop, the economic backdrop is strong enough and the market itself is receptive to um, coming in and taking the risk on a public company. So we see it, we, we think that 2018 should shape up to be a very good year, but of course it all is dependent on this backdrop remaining benign and remaining um, inviting to these companies. So would, would trade and expectations of, uh, I don't wanna go as far as a trade war, but <laughs> upsets between countries be enough to derail what we're talking about right now? Well, I think that certainly, you have to look at, at the end of the day, investors are looking at the fundamentals of a company itself. So they're, they're saying, what could disrupt the ability for this company to grow and expand its business? And to the extent that the company is dependent on some level of trade um, as part of that, then obviously that could become a negative that the investors would look, like, look at. But the fact is that the investors do look at the fundamentals of the company against an overall backdrop in the economy. So it, they are able to discern between just a general maybe trade issue in a sector that has nothing to do with the company versus one that could impact the company. And, and of course, inflation and interest rates are key to the story as well. So we'll, we'll get back to that. But Frank Capella, jump in here because you look, you're, you're looking at the world obviously through a logistics standpoint. What do you see? Yeah, so, you know, we should not worry too much about, you know, protectionism because there's a lot of saying for now so long, you know, I have been in Davos more than, more than 10 years and every time it came up, every time we felt the next year would be very difficult and politics are so important, we should put it in perspective. And in 2009, we felt the world will collapse, we will never see a recovery, what happened, sharp recovery. You know, then we had the austerity and the euro might collapse, it didn't happen. So, and even these problems are nothing in comparison to what the world has seen in the last century of two global wars or world wars. So. You know, we, the world is in better shape. If you go to The Economist and look into the statistics for last pages, you know, this is the only case I can remember that you see only one minus and beyond that only pluses. So and that is what's happening. And if you do tariffs in place, who pays are the citizens of a country who puts the tariffs in place because they have to pay more for the products. And you protect a couple of employees the only way out of that is to make your country more competitive. And, you know, my home country is a very good example. You know, we were a lost country in Europe 20, 15 years ago, and now it's a powerhouse in Europe. And why? Because we did the right reforms to make the country more competitive. So I think, you know, this is just noise on the horizon. And even if the U.S. does more protectionism, consumers will buy from different places. And who pays the bill are the employees in the U.S. finally. Hmm. Interesting. Teacher? Yeah, maybe building on that... Um, you make me feel old, too. I came here the first time in 1996, and uh, I was in a, how can I call it, a basement somewhere for a discussion on Africa. And there was um, Jacques Attali and, um, sorry, Soros, and uh, I think Bill Gates and myself, and I think we were four in the basement talking about Africa for an hour. Um, I'm going somewhere like that. If you look at what's happened in the world since then, and we were dreaming of spreading education in Africa, um, um, the, the effort for universal education that has taken place in so many emerging markets has transformed 20 years later. Today, you, you, you're facing a completely different situation. Take China-Africa trade. In 15 years, it's gone from zero to $200 billion. Okay? $200 billion, as far as I know, U.S.-China exports are 350. So 200 big starts to become material and it's growing at 15% per annum. So I think what people miss often is just the, the, the spread of prosperity. 
the impact of education, people being able to seize opportunity, and just the, the extension in scale and in size of the world economy and the market economy is producing very positive effects. And it's, it's, uh, I'm surprised sometimes by how surprised people are. Yeah. Um, it's, um, if, you at, um, if you look at global wealth, take um, assets, financial assets of people with one, more than $1 million from 06. So you take a point before the crisis, not to distort the analysis. From 06 to 16, they've grown by $26 trillion. $26 trillion from 06, 17 in emerging markets, nine in developed economies. And that 17 and that nine is, is important. And the 17 is growing faster and faster. So all that is, is driving the economy forward, I think. Hmm. Interesting. Steve, same question for you about this trade issue and whether or not this could be seen as the start of something bigger and potentially derail all of the good news that Tijan just laid out. Well, there's there a variety of trade issues uh, around the world. Um, the U.S. is involved with a, with a number of them, uh, whether, whether it's NAFTA or, um, uh, you know, China. There's, there's no, there needs a new agreement with, with, with Europe. The U.S. is sort of um, action central uh, for a lot of this, and there's also that's got to remake all of its relationships. Uh, no small task, actually. Uh, uh, so, you know, you know part, part of these issues, you know, come from imbalances. Uh, so, some of the imbalances are somewhat, um, you know, structural, the way things are, are uh, fashioned at the moment. So, for example, you know, uh, China U.S. Has a, has a really very substantial um, uh, trade deficit on the U.S. side. Um, and, you know, it's $350, $400 billion. So why does that happen? It, it, it happens really, uh, you know, for a variety of reasons. But, but China's tariffs and, and taxes uh, are, are about 27 percent compared to bringing goods into the United States from China at nine. So if you're three times higher, um, th there's not going to be as much stuff brought in, logic would say, and that's where it stands. So, so, so that relationship over time uh, is going to have to be uh, uh, changed. Um, and that, that would be appropriate. China's grown up behind a tariff wall, which you know the United States did in the, in the 19th century. This is how emerging countries make their way. Uh, and the only question is, how long will that continue? And I think that's why you're seeing some of the, the, the tariff actions. I think the Chinese are, are, are very smart, and they're, they're aware of that. And so you know, I'm optimistic that, that over the intermediate term, you know, that issue will, will be addressed. Um, you know, NAFTA is a is a different thing. It's, it's, it's much more you know, immediate and um, colorful. Uh, and um, you know, there's a way of making a good NAFTA deal. If you don't do that, uh, there'll primarily be dislocations uh, in Mexico, which could have really adverse political um, uh, impact, uh, which would be bad uh, for the United States, be bad for uh, for Mexico, and with the Canadians, we're pretty close to to even either way, and they they, they have a trade agreement uh, in place already that they could fall back on. So, you know, would, would it bring the world down? No. Uh, would it make life uncomfortable in a variety of industries? Uh, um, yes. Uh, do you have to get to that place? Not necessarily. Uh, so. You know, I think it's one of those um, stay tuned and, and, and let's see what happens. And, you know, hopefully we can negotiate our way through those, uh, uh, some of those imbalances. So is it fair to say this year will likely, we'll see some of these things come to a head? I mean, given that NAFTA negotiations are to begin in the next week or two, and we'll see something in terms of Mexico's response, Canada's response as well as perhaps a response from China on the solar panel. 
uh, import uh, tariffs. Will this be coming to a head this year? Well, NAFTA clearly will come to a head this year, absolutely. Um, as to China, I think it's a process. Uh, I think the Chinese typically tend to be pretty measured. Uh, there's all kinds of complexity going on with China vis-a-vis -vis North Korea, which um, is, is sort of the main event, uh, if you will, uh, I think, geopolitically. I mean, if anything goes wrong, uh, you know, the, the U.S. has announced they don't uh, uh, see the, the possibility of, uh, of having uh, North Korea have a ballistic missile capability that could hit the United States with a functioning uh, nuclear warhead on top of it. I mean, the U.S. has said that numerous times. N no one apparently is listening in the financial markets um, because I think they think it just won't happen. If, 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 if that does happen, uh, you, you would have, uh, I think, financial markets at uh, much different levels, and, and that doesn't mean up. Uh, so, so, you know, there's, there's real stuff out there that's uh, worthy of concern, um, I think. And, and those are the big risks. Uh, it's, it's not the normal things people talk about at Davos, which are economic issues. I think the, the world's in a good place uh, economically, about as good as it could be, pretty much. Uh, so, so all the discussions that focus on that are... I think not uh, particularly useful. Um, it's these other issues that if you were underwriting risk, that's where you'd be spending your time, not worrying about what a central bank is going to do to mismanage its affairs. Brian. So, so if you think about uh, what Brian Contidium and Steve just talked about, you're talking about the inherent tension in, in the sense that a country looking at its own citizens and uh, lower cost goods and lower cost capabilities and employment levels. And, you know, I think 18 is going to be a little bit about the United States uh, trying to make itself a bit more competitive from a tax rate, from regulatory parameters that already had a good workforce, energy, and th had substantial energy resources. And so as that changes, that dynamic is going to reverberate a little bit in the world. And so there's an attitude about, you know, that you hear from the administration about free trade also has to be fair trade. but but that has to settle back to a real question, which is how do you get those imbalances straightened out a little bit? Um, but on the other hand, the struggle is with this level of unemployment in the United States, the reality of bringing a lot of jobs back is difficult. When you talk to our clients and customers uh, out there, you know, they can't, the, the difficulty of finding uh, currently trained capable workers and not having population growth are two critical issues we face in our country. And so, and by the way, that's not wholly unique to us. Many, many of the major developed societies have the same issue. And so, as, as wonderful as Africa and the development of that, you have the equal offset of developed countries having population declines or stagnation, and also the talent the workforce is deployed. It's not that they don't have it, it's all deployed. So I think you're going to see as the United States sort of resettles its competitiveness, there'll be reverberations in the market, even if you don't get to a geopolitical conflict that'll be interesting to watch sort out. And I think the market discounts it on the theory that it all works. But if you think about large global companies, they can go anywhere and they're going to be looking for places to go. Enthusiasm. I heard just last night from a, at a dinner uh, with a bunch of people from outside the United States. The United States is now you know, the thing to talk about for the next 12 to 18, 24 months in terms of manufacturing facilities and capabilities and selling which isn't a trade question, which is a local manufacturing sold to local demand question. So this will be an interesting play that the United States tax rate is much more competitive than other things. So they, they think that manufacturing in the U.S. Is, is what is going to be interesting and exciting in growth. It, because you have a, a consumption rate that's picking up. You have an employment rate that's full plus and go, going beyond. We have it going to 3.7 by year on 18. And you have an economic growth, which is increasing at a much faster pace. The economy is so big. You add all that together and you say, if I can make a, a thing, why don't I go there and make it as energy, talent, uh, resources, and a regulatory uh, pendulum swinging back? That'll be an interesting dynamic for a while. Yeah, it's interesting because it dovetails on immigration as well. 
Yeah, enough um, people do the work. That's the question. Right. Where, where are the people to yeah. do the work it, it, with this low unemployment? Let's talk policy coming out of the U.S. for a moment and the implications. We talked about trade, and obviously that dovetails on, on immigration as well with regard to job creation, but tax policy, Adina. What has been the impact so far of the U.S. administration's changes in tax law? Well, I do think that you can see the markets have reacted very quickly, and, and frankly, they really were previewing it before the tax law came into effect. But certainly the impact on companies is very positive for the most part. That means that they hopefully will use that money to both um, provide benefits to the shareholders as well as invest in their businesses, which would then drive more interest and in, in, uh, demand for employment which then kind of creates that cycle again of where do you find the people, how do you make sure that you um, are, are able to attract the right talent. But it is definitely a growth driver for the United States. And it's making it so that when you are looking to do business around the world, the United States doesn't get disadvantaged by having a much higher tax rate. So global companies look to come to the United States or the U.S. companies don't have to necessarily do unnatural things to take their business outside the United States because they now can kind of live in a tax policy world that's pretty, uh, I would say, even across most of the developed markets. So I actually see it as a way to kind of drive more natural behavior of a global economy with the U.S. being highly competitive and highly, um, I would say, you know, very, very attractive as a destination for business. Yeah, I, I want to see if there's an impact uh, uh, across the world. Steve, uh, you're, you're dealing with businesses across the world. Have you seen an impact, um, a trigger, as a result of the tax law in the United States, where you're seeing changes in terms of investment yeah. globally. Yeah. yeah, I, you know, yeah, everyone on this panel travels around a of lot. Course. It's like a life sentence uh, that we all have. <laughs> so we get to hear a lot about what's going on. And as Adina uh, indicated, uh, there, there are going to be a lot of flows into the United States. And uh, I think this has been a, an underestimated to forgotten uh, aspect of uh, the tax reform, uh, certainly as you listen to the U.S. commentators, that, that uh, you know, there are companies all around the world who are looking at the U.S. now and saying, this is the place to be in the developed world. And, you know, just for all the reasons that, that Brian mentioned, you know, low, low, lower taxes and, you know, reversing of uh, regulation uh, and, and, you know, uh, workforce that's, that's educated and, and so, you know, I, I go to places where people in, in non-U.S. companies say, geez, we're gonna increase our employment there. We're gonna, we're gonna move more things there, why? Because we're gonna be able to sell more things and it's a much more hospitable environment than, than it used to be. That aspect of things can be uh, a, a real supplement uh, to what regular economists think is, is going to happen. Leave aside bringing cash back and those types of things that people talk about. Non-U.S. people view this as really a very, very big deal. Look, look at what China did. Um, uh, you know, like I guess it was a week or two after you know, the tax reform was passed, they, they made certain types of activities from, from U.S. companies tax-free in China. So that if they wouldn't bring the money back to the U.S., that's that's a major country speaking right. very quickly, uh, and European uh, governments are talking about this. And you know, we really have a, a wonderful thing that was created here that's been kept virtually a total secret uh, from economists and the media. I think, I think we're going to find a very positive surprise. So, so you've seen evidence that people are changing investment plans and actually moving into the U.S. because of the change in tax law. Well, what I'm saying is they're talking about it. I don't know if they've changed their plans. What is it, a month? But, uh, I mean, so, so but, but I, I, I'm saying I expect this to happen because when people start talking openly uh, in a casual way about that in many different <laughs> Venues where I am, not conferences, but like real places, mm. uh, and you know, <laughs> uh, you know, where you're sitting with people, <laughs> you know, uh, and and they say we're we're gonna we're gonna do more things in the United States now. This is unprompted. Yeah. I'm not asking them. I'm not an interviewer. It's a great um, point. Yeah, I'd, like yeah that, I'd like to second that very much. I mean, certainly as a, as a bank, we see it in the dialogue we have with CEOs. We've absolutely seen a, a step up 
in the interest. We just announced last week uh, something we advised on, which is Ferrero bought the chocolate business of Nestle, the US chocolate business of Nestle, $2.8 billion, and there's a whole pipeline of similar transactions building. So to your point, Steve, it's not just, a, I mean, in the real world, that, that's really happening. We can see a lot of evidence of it. I think it's also good news because um, reflecting back on Europe and what you said, Brian, on the politics of all this, um, it's been very hard for Europe in the, the last 10 years because the demography is, is very challenging. As we know, a lot of the pension systems are unbalanced and it's generated a lot of angst among, you know, let's say, call them the 35 to 55 in Europe who we'll see a future where pensions are at risk, their children cannot buy a house because they cannot fund the, the initial um, investment uh, to buy a house, unemployment remaining quite high, and that has produced quite a challenging political uh, mix, uh, which has translated into um, a rise of a certain type of populism, etc. So the, the, the return to growth, the decrease of unemployment in Europe, um, I think can very much be helped by structural reforms, as we see in France, but also by uh, an increase in external demand, which the US is, is, is providing at the right time. Because I also think that we were, QE was kind of, had run its course. You know, the provision of extra liquidity to the system, which drove growth post the um, global financial crisis, had run its course, and we needed a, a new leg to, to world growth. And I, I think, you know, I don't know if it's luck or skill, but certainly the, the tax reform in the US has been exactly what we needed, something in the real economy, fundamental to happen at this point in time to give a new, um, a new impetus to, to, to world growth. So I, I, do, I do believe that the, the positive impacts of that are underestimated today. Yes, yeah, may, 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 let me jump in there here because, you know, these tax reform, it's probably more positive for the world than, you know, but, you know, these measures have limited short-term impact. I think we have, government should look like companies have to do in the fundamentals. So it's about infrastructure of a country. It's about education of the people in the country. It's about free trade. It's about a balanced budget. You know, we can't burn the money for the future. So if a tax reform leads to higher budget deficits, it might be good for the next 12 months, but there will be a bill later on. And then you have to balance that again. So I think that is, you know, I'm a chemist from education. I always puzzled to say, you know, I'm looking for fundamentals. What the world needs, every country needs, is productivity gains. If you don't increase productivity, you will never be successful on the long run. And productivity comes from better education of the people better infrastructure, competitive pressure, that means open borders, and that's the recipe. And you see that in Singapore. You know, Singapore has nothing. They were in the muds 50 years ago. What they have done, they invested in infrastructure, they invested in education, they are the most open market, uh, except Netherlands, in the world, and the success is there. And that's the recipe for success. And all these short-term orientation, let's reduce tax rates, and this is, you know, you, actually you can't reduce tax rate if you have huge deficits. Bring your balance first back to, you know, the budget back to the balance, and then you can think about tax reductions. That's my belief, because you need the money to invest in education, in infrastructure, in the competitiveness of the country. That's my belief. So the tax reform in the U.S. will be good short term, because it creates, you know, more, you know, purchase yeah. power and whatsoever, but it doesn't fix uh, the fundamental you, problems. You just neglect the fact that the U.S. is a completely different economy. It's what we call, you know, <laughs> it's in a unique position which is that the rest of the world is willing to finance its deficits. And that makes it very different from Germany or any other normal country. The rest of the world is very happy to finance the US deficit, as we see China doing, et cetera, et cetera, or US Treasury market. So the way you think about economics, if you run the US economy, is different from the traditional model of a, of No, I hope that you're right, so we will you know, see. The US, <laughs> it's been the case so far. Look at the US Treasury auctions every week. So it sounds like you're not so positive on this tax plan, though, because it's a short-term sugar high. I think so. But, but he's yeah. bringing up the structural question of debts, and it, you have it across the world, and, and those are serious issues. I agree with Frank that we've got to deal with. The question is, you know, it comes back to your belief of the private sector versus the public sector in terms of reallocating the resources and putting them to work is, is inherently the question, which is, you know, do you have governments have, have shifted too much in the public sector? Therefore, they become the only source of infrastructure. They become the only source of education. And what you're seeing, corporate world, and this is not a US phenomenon around the world, is realizing that 
corporations, and this is obviously what Klaus has been driving here for years and years and years, corporations have to take on more of the burden, whether it's environmental, whether it's training, whether it's uh, uh, repurposing assets, whether it's development work, you pick, you pick your answer. Um, and it's, that's what we're driving. That's the sustainable development goals. That's what we do. That's what we do in our, in our co company. So incumbent upon reducing the governmental burden of taxation on corporations is an equal and opposite burden to actually drive some of the initiatives that could do it. There's a ton of money for infrastructure. There's a ton of money. It takes some structural reform on governments to make it come to bear. There's a ton of money for environmental work. We have a $125 billion program. We're halfway through in four years. You know, it's going out the door. Uh, but you just got to, the government's got to be a role in activating that money as opposed to it's going to fund all those projects. And I think there's some potential to get these budgets back in line. So the, the other factor with the U.S. economy is its ability to innovate, which is second to none. Mm -hmm. If we talk about intellectual capital and the ability to innovate and create new wealth, uh, it is absolutely the most best performing system in the world. And that, that is an additional factor added to a traditional ones uh, who could foresee Facebook 15 years ago. Um, and I've seen a study recently that shows that for every job destroyed by technology, there's now 2.4 jobs created in the medium term. If you look at five to 10 years, not in the short term, but in the medium term. And that dynamic as is something that I think, if you reason in a static rather than a dynamic way, is easy to get wrong. Because that additional growth later is what's gonna pay the taxes to balance your budget. If you're, if you're in a static model where you are trying to budget and balance a budget in a, in a given year, right. I think you don't, take, you don't make these types of reforms, which are actually, I think, indispensable. And the other point, which I think Brian emphasized, is the starting point. Uh, whether you should uh, decrease taxes or not depends on your starting point. Uh, if you take France, which has a 57.5%, the size of a public sector is 57.5% of GDP, well, there is room there to decrease tax, although there is a budget deficit. Okay. And if you, if you, if you take a, a negative approach with such a bad starting point of trying to balance the budget, you'll never get there. Hmm. Yeah, I would say only time will tell, but I, you know, if you assume that you kind of create a more competitive tax model within the United States as compared to the rest of the world, so that more business comes to the United States, that then drives even more employment, that then drives more of a motivation to train employees, and to get more production up, that then drives more revenue, which then obviously over time could address some of the budget issues. Um, and I agree on the private, what I call private public infrastructure spending. I think we do need to find much more creative ways to manage infrastructure and to try to improve our infrastructure in the United States with a lot of money ready to be put to work if it can be done efficiently. It, the issue is the inefficiency in the system or in infrastructure as opposed to the demand to get things done. So I personally like this, the, tax, the tax policy because I think it creates a much more competitive dynamic. You mentioned all the other things. So you know, we have great educated people. We have a great system. We definitely need improvement in infrastructure. Um, but we have a, a great model to start with. And if we can create a very competitive tax model globally, that should drive more business into the United States. And that's kind of, I think, the whole yeah, well, theory. What I meant is just time. what a single measure doesn't help. You have to do all the other things Agreed. as well. Okay. Absolutely. That's a problem, and if that happens, we will see. Yeah, exactly, and time will tell, because we have a lot of inefficiencies we have to take care of, and there's no doubt about it. I want to ask you I've about infrastructure in a never second. never to bet against the U.S. economy. I'm sorry, teacher? I said I've learned over time never to bet against the U.S. economy. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, not, it's not been a winning strategy. The thing is that what this is against a backdrop, it's not against a backdrop of 2010 or 2009 or 2008 where you're trying to reset and get something going, the point that Hank Frank was mentioning earlier. It's against the backdrop of consumer spending just in our group of consumers. The increase in year over year is $125 billion of spending. And so, wow. you know, those are just at Bank of America's customers. So there's a lot of the other, there's a substantial part of America out there that we can still get. But, um, you know, so you think about that. That's the backdrop, a low unemployment rate. So there are some inflationary risks out there, as Steve mentioned earlier. There are some other issues which could reverberate off this. But it's against a solid backdrop, both on a worldwide level, as you said in your opening, and in the United States. And the U.S. consumer economy is, you know, 60-odd percent, 70-almost percent. And that is a big economy on its own. And if that's growing at that rate yeah. and the people are spending and are employed, that helps all these other countries and you really can't have a trade war because demand's going to be so much the U.S. can't fulfill the demand. So whether it's automobiles, whether it's uh, you know, TVs, whatever it is, the U.S. consumer knows how to spend and, and you don't have to teach them to do that.
I, I want to ask you, Frank, and to Jane, about European policies, because we talked a, a bit about U.S. policy. But, but let's close the loop here, Steve. Are you expecting an infrastructure change, a, a, an infrastructure plan to be among this administration's next big policies? Well, if you, if you take the, the chaos that's, that's sort of enveloped the U.S. legislative, legislative process over the last week or two and probably will go forward for the next uh, three to four weeks um, and move that aside, next up uh, is infrastructure. And the uh, U.S. has a $2 trillion minimum infrastructure uh, deficit. Uh, that, that's a big number um, and, and requires a lot of work. Uh, infrastructure breaks into two pieces. Uh, the, the first uh, is, are the approval processes, uh, where, where the U.S. is about uh, as bad as any country in the world. Uh, it takes us somewhere between 10 and 15 years uh, to approve a project, uh, you know, sometimes it's faster, but usually it's, it's, it's not because we have so many jurisdictions, uh, no one in charge of anything, uh, legal suits all along the way. Uh, and um, compare this uh, with uh, countries like Germany uh, and Canada. You know, nobody talks about the G7, but these are G7 countries. And they managed to approve things in two years. How is it possible that they have a good environment and they approve projects in two years and we take 10 to 15? How, how is it possible, Steve? It's, it's possible that because well-meaning people over a period of 20 years, 25 years, have added so many different approvals to protect the environment and other things that, that, that these uh, regulations and laws uh, are, are, are not integrated and they work against each other along with our system. But real countries do this in two years. And so the administration, um, uh, and say what you want about Donald Trump, he did spend his life building things, um, you know, look at this and just shake their head and say, what in the world are we doing here? And, and they happen to be right. We're not achieving uh, the country's objectives, and everybody admits that. So that's the first thing, which is passing some laws to make things more efficient and also changing regulations, which, which you know, sort of can be done that will improve uh, processes. The second thing is money. Uh, you know, in, in our country, just to bring you up to date, uh, the Democrats would like to have a trillion dollars uh, of public money spent. Uh, the uh, Republicans, I think, feel more or less, they've sort of used a lot of their money and want to put up $200 billion. These are 10-year numbers in toto, so it's $20 billion a year. Unfortunately, that doesn't do much. Uh, and, and, but the Republicans want to use the private sector uh, with sort of the, what's called the Australian model. Now, the Australian model is very, very successful. And what happened in Australia, and other countries have used this in pieces, uh, is they have an earning asset, you know, we'll call it a bridge, call it an airport. Uh, there are all kinds of earning assets in infrastructure. And they sell that asset uh, to the private sector. Uh, and uh, the private sector pays whatever they think it's worth, which is a lot, typically, in a world of low interest rates. The federal government in Australia adds a tip to encourage the local states and municipalities to do this of about 15 percent. So you've got 115 percent of fair value for that asset, but the federal government requires the local governments to reinvest that money to build new infrastructure. Because infrastructure comes in two types. The first type generates cash income. The second type is just like a road in your community. It doesn't generate any direct income. So somebody's got to, in effect, finance that. And that's, that's basically a government finances the, 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 the asset that doesn't yield anything. And the private sector can finance it. And that's something that, that the Republicans would really like to have happen. The Democrats, for some reason, don't want that to happen. I don't know why. 
Um, but in any case, it's one of the few areas that both Republicans and Democrats want something to happen because they know the country needs it. Uh, and if you do it, it's also good for overall economic growth. But more importantly, as, as Frank says, you, you must have uh, good infrastructure. And um, our infrastructure has fallen, I guess, to you know, different people rate it. Uh, we used to be one or two in the world. Uh, now we're down in the mid-teens in education. We were number one in the world 40 years ago. We're number 27. So Frank's issues that he puts on the table uh, as, as the underlying fundamentals of what makes a great uh, economy longer term are absolutely right. Both have to be addressed. Tijan, did you want to add to that? Um, no, on the infrastructure, I can only agree. I, in, I chaired, um, I was appointed by the French and the US government, I chaired a high level panel on infrastructure for a year for the G20. And we produce a report and I, it's the single best investment you can make. Um, um, Jin Likun was the representative of China on the panel. He now runs the Asia Infrastructure Bank and runs the Roads and Belt Initiative. And when you see what China has achieved, um, you know, driving, actually, if you look at the Chinese success, um, Jin Likun was the person who introduced the first toll roads in China that then the Chinese government used to finance all its initial infrastructure development and the initial growth of a special economic zone. So. I think the case for infrastructure doesn't need to be made. The benefits are huge. And in uh, particular in developed economies, um, it's one of the few things that can help pay those famous pensions. Uh, it's, you know, you can, you can, you can uh, match those long-term liabilities that we'll have beyond 30 years with long-term uh, income producing assets, which only infrastructure provides. So I think it's uh, the challenge as Steve described is always political. It's really how do, you, how do you get the political system and the legal system in a country to operate in such a way that you can drive infrastructure development fast. And I think all the countries that have done it well, whether it's Germany or France or Canada or Australia, share a common characteristic that it's relatively easy to um, design a project, uh, fund it, uh, get it off the ground, and, and get it done. So um, whilst taking into account environmental constraints, et cetera. So it's, uh, and it's great jobs. I mean, it's really the only kind of economic endeavor that's just a, uh, universally positive, creates jobs, uh, allows you to pay your pensions, uh, generates revenue for the central government and reduces your deficits and increasing the productivity of factors in the economy uh, because people can move, because you have energy to run your factories, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's, um, it's, um, it's always a topic of wonder to see why there is not more um, investment in infrastructure, but it's, um, it's, um, it's vital. Frank, what do you want to see out of European policymakers uh, in terms of their response? I mean, or continuing at, or to accelerate growth that we've seen begin in Europe? Yeah, I, I think Europe has done in certain dimensions pretty well with uh, bringing budgets back uh, on track um, and seeing our growth. I think what Europe, and I have said that very often, Europe has to focus on their fundamental strengths, in which is high education level and make that region more competitive. So therefore, what Macron does is right. It will make France more competitive, and that's good news. Because if France is in good shape and Germany is in good shape, that will be definitely good for Europe. Whole Eastern Europe depends on how these two countries are doing, because they are producing stuff which is then finalized, finally assembled in other parts and then exported to China and other parts of the world. So I think this is important that the Europeans are focusing how do they make these region more competitive. And that's not different from any part of the world. And I think Europe has a tremendous starting point because Europe is very strong in D2B, has a lot of small com companies strong in B2B. On average, the education level is still by far the best around the world. And that is a competitive advantage if you think about digitalization. If you then think you have to protect, 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 instead of making more competitive, open it and make people more competitive, I think then it's wrong. And I think what Macron is now doing I think finally France is getting the place into the right place as well and making the country more competitive. And if Germany and France are doing well, Europe will do very well. Many smaller countries have done the right reforms. Anyway, Portugal, Ireland, even Spain is doing much better. We see even in our businesses where the reforms are really paying back. And I think therefore <clears throat> it is in a very important moment that we really focus on competitiveness. The problem is it's all about migration. 
and it's all about other stuff, and that's a problem. So that's the reason why business has to play an important role. Wherever I can, I talk to all people and say why migration is important, you know, why competitiveness is open, why free trade is open. We had just a meeting in Dubai where we assembled the 200 countries of the world we are serving, or the 220. You know, we are talking about why globalization is great, why digitalization is good, you know, and we see as well the mood of these people who are working where the countries are in conflict, but our people are doing a great service for our customers. And they are friends, they like each other because they belong to DHL and they feel as found family. And I think that's the role of business in the changing world. The business has to explain that our people first. We have half a million people. So if we explain our people that the world is a great place, that globalization is good for everybody, where digitalization is even better, you know, then we can make a difference. That is our job. But on the other side, we have to demand that politicians in Europe focus on the competitiveness and leverage the education level we have. Yeah, for sure. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to open it up to questions. We want to hear from you. So if you have a question, we have microphones uh, walking around. Please just raise your hand. And Steve, as we do that, your thoughts on European policy. What do you want to see out of European? I mean, obviously, high marks for Macron, as, as Frank just mentioned. What would you like to see from policymakers in Europe? I, I think... Europe's doing really very well. And, you know, we're, we're big investors uh, in Europe, and we have been uh, over the last three years, and it looks like that ship is, is uh, coming to port. Uh, and and um, I think that the Europeans themselves, um, from what we could see in the areas where we uh, invest, basically had lost confidence uh, in, in themselves. Uh, and, and in the prospects uh, for uh, their countries, which provided an amazing opportunity for us. We were quite confident uh, about Europe. Uh, and now Europe has awakened. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I agree, uh, you know, with, with, uh, with Frank that the change in France is, is uh, pretty, uh, was unexpected uh, and remarkable. Uh, and more changes, you know, in terms of basic reforms uh, in, in Europe uh, is, is the right idea. I, I think, you know, it's way beyond my brief, uh, but, but the way the European Union is organized uh, leads it to be um, sort of the last major part in the world in terms of being able to react on a timely basis. It's, it's a very uh, kludgy uh, type of um, uh, administrative structure, governance, more flexibility, gov governance structure, and you know, for example, uh, in their central bank, they're they're always last because they need all these countries agreeing. It's uh, financial policy is is very difficult to do, uh, and and you need to be able to move on a timely basis and quickly. It's no surprise that Europe was the last uh, out of the financial crisis because everything happens last. And, and that's, that's a function of governance structure. And, and, you know, I don't know how to change governance structure because usually once it's in place, it's in somebody's interest to have it not work efficiently, apparently. Mm. Uh, you know, I don't know how that works exactly, but, <clears throat> but, you know, that's usually not the best outcome. So some types of reforms in those areas are, you know, sort of, I think, will only accelerate good things that are happening in Europe. I think that just to go to European reforms, that the principles of them, I think you've seen people talk about and you're seeing in France move quickly. The question is, can you make them last long enough that people can be dependent upon them? And so the, the issue is that, you know, you have the turnovers in governments and then you have the additional layer above it that makes it, when you make a business decision, you have to predict a decade or two, mm. and you need that predictability. And so the constraint on investment and the constraint on infrastructure and the constraint on all of this is predictability across multiple decades uh, that allows for the, the concession grant or the, or the investment of the factory. And I think the key is that as they make these reforms, they embed them so deeply in the way they're going to be, they can't be pulled back out. And there's great uh, concern. Um, distrust, right, would be the, that, yes, you start in and then two years later a new government forms and then it comes That's back right. out. And that, that, I think, is the number one issue. How do you embed these almost constitutionally at a level that they can't be taken back? It's a really Mark, important Mark, point, Mark, 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 Mark. right? Let's, well, one, one thing, I, you know, 
I think ought to be discussed. I'm not the person to do it. I've talked enough anyhow. Uh, but, but, you know, the, the Brexit and how that works out, if, if you're talking about Europe, I'm surprised nobody even mentioned it anymore. Mm. Uh, that, you know, that, that could have a variety of, of positive sum games outcome, or it can be pretty negative. And so I, I, I throw that to you and to anybody who wants to dribble that ball. Yeah, but if no, you're you, right. I, just to do it, as, as a Frenchman um, in favor of France, um, and I, I was a long time a French, a France bear, <laughs> now a France bull, um, Macron only got elected because the French uh, public, the French nation decided to change. That's how it works in a democracy. Uh, a program like Macron's would have led to certain electoral defeat 20 years ago in France. But the state of the opinion has definitely and irreversibly changed. So my take is that this is there to stay. He would not have gotten those votes if the nation had not decided to move on. The reason why there was no explosion in September when he passed the labor reforms. You know, we, we're very good at yeah. immobilizing the economy. We know how to. The reason we didn't, <laughs> the reason we didn't is that everybody has now recognized that we must change and move on. So I, I would have some confidence but in that. But I also, I think part of it is because of Brexit. So I think Brexit, I think a lot of the, uh, continental Europe realizes there's a big opportunity that comes on the back of Brexit if they position their economies the right way, their labor force the right way, mm -hmm. their employment practices the right way. So there's, there's great incentive right now, in my opinion, that they can really capitalize on mm -hmm. and therefore have real benefits, lasting benefits to their economies if they do it right and, frankly, negotiate appropriately on the Brexit, the which, Brexit vote. Which is so, an unknown. Which is an unknown. Right. And it's obviously the beginning, just the beginning of a long negotiation. But I think it's great that you're seeing a lot of the other countries becoming as competitive as possible so that they have, they become an inviting place for financial services and some of the key industries that may end up shifting some of their practices over to continental Europe. Are you worried about Brexit? Teach on Brian. It's, it's, uh, it's uncertainty. It's a lot of work. It, you don't know where it's going to come out. And, and there's a lot of things, as Steve said earlier, have to be taken care of. And so you have to worry about it. We have a question there in the audience and then, and then right here. Yes. Um, good morning. Thank you so much for your comments. I'm Kanika and I'm a global shaper from Mumbai in India. As a young girl working in India and having heard a lot of your comments on the US and the US uh, and Europe, I wonder if it's needed and if yes, will we ever be able to shift the balance of power that currently rests between the US and Europe to other markets? And if it's needed, what are organizations like yours, multinational organizations, doing to balance this power dynamic? Thoughts? Well, we, we've been in India for 50-odd years, and our job is to help the clients and customers grow that economy. Our economists have it predicted at 7.5% better next year. Uh, your prime minister has done a fabulous job of uh, reforming a place, as Titchen uh, talked about France, you talk about a country. and I, and it's all extremely positive, and I think the world's recognizing that, the FDI and the stuff is going. So you have a huge population, an emerging population, a talent base. Uh, we have 20,000 teammates there. I, I think it's, it, it's all good. And so I, I don't think the world has to do anything. I think you ha the country has to keep doing what it's doing, and it'll just keep coming. And, and we will continue to see. We've got Prime Minister Modi speaking in about an hour, and, and he will uh, clearly uh, lay out of the growth story for, for India. No, wait, let, let me... Go ahead, Frank. I, I, I have the same view of Brian. The interesting thing is that if you have a prime minister who understands the fundamentals of economics, he does the right reforms. And Modi is doing that. It takes, like in India, obviously, a little bit longer than hope, we hope for, but it works. You know, We have waited for the general sales tax reform for more than a decade. I heard that when I was in India the first time for our business in you know, 2005, and that next year we will have a general sales tax reform. Never happened, and now it happens, and it's right that what it happened, it will have positive impact. So, and Modi understood, <coughs> understands the basic concept of economy, and that's the reason why he does the right reforms, and that will pay back to India, in, in, and I think in a big way. We have invested heavily in India for the last years, and our business is growing tremendously there. Thank you for raising that. It's very important. We appreciate that. Yes, sir. Apparently, um, apparently the growth in Europe is going to be critical for the next uh, decade. Um, beyond US and Asia, which is 
uh, clear enough. Um, the critical point about the competitiveness in Europe uh, is, uh, don't you think that this is not enough to have these two engines, uh, Germany and France, leading Europe only? Because every system, this is a fundamental um, principle question, is uh, as good as, as the periphery. So how are we going to increase the competitiveness in Europe? Because if you keep on this model of producing for Germany and, and France, that exporting to Asia and to the rest is not enough. Um, to, to Frank, basically. Yeah, so maybe, maybe Steve as no, well. You're, you're right, but I, I believe uh, you know many European countries have done good reforms, um, and you know in smaller countries as well. Uh, you know they have a lot of trade with Germany and France. Uh, not every country has done his homework, but many, and many have really taken drastic actions, and that is now really improving the situation in these countries. So you can, you know, I said over Portugal, all the Eastern European countries are doing significantly better. If you go there, you know, I was there in the f first time before the Iron Curtain came down and what I see now is black and white. It's amazing what has happened there. You know, we should be proud of that as a European saying, listen, you know, we talk about China, what they have done. We have done it next door. Eastern European is a different place now. Southern European parts, when, and I was the first time as a teenager in, in uh, Iberia, and it's black and white, what you see now. And that is what we have achieved. And I think Europe has taken tough austerity measures, and they are paying back now. Now we should not stop and say, oh, it's nice. We have still challenges, and that's the reason why we have to continue. And I, and I, I think the gentleman is from Bulgaria. Sorry if I reveal something. But I, I think Merkel and Macron, the leadership of Europe, is acutely aware of this. And I think they're driving Europe with that in mind, to make sure that the prosperity spreads and that it's not just France and Germany. Real quick, Stefano, your question. Um, I'm so glad to hear so uh, many positive comments and so much optimism. Uh, but I see a divergence between the economy and uh, the political environment in uh, Europe, at least in some part of Europe. We, we just mentioned Brexit, but Brexit is going to be certainly a, a, a drawback in terms of growth. We have a southern part of Europe, which is still at 15, 12 to 15 percent on the unemployment. And uh, we don't see that kind of productivity happening, if not in Germany, which is obviously leading, but uh, as a unity. So do you think that uh, politics and economy in Europe will converge or will continue to see this, these two world basically working uh, to different paths? Real quick. Now, this is, an, this is a very interesting question, because if you look into Brexit, when it, Brexit came, I said, oh, that's a nightmare. Uncertainty now for many years will be bad for business. It didn't happen. You know, you know Brian, you said uncertainty is not good. But I expect the same. It was not as bad as expected. What really now can happen if the EU and the UK create a mess from this divorce, then it will have really impact. So they can disrupt what is happening. The uncertainty is one thing, but businesses keep going and consumers are keep going. Yeah. What really can have a significant negative impact is yeah. if that is a bad divorce, if that's a hard yeah. Brexit, it will have negative impact on Europe and the UK in the we, same way. Uh, if I may, just <laughs> the great strength of Europe is democracy. I'm a great believer in democracy. People, populism makes people pessimistic. It makes me optimistic because the social issues that are... Um, put in focus by the populism are yeah. real. Okay, I mean, I taught in lower income uh, right. places, children, and that, those issues are now being raised and they will be addressed. Better to bring them out rather than try to sweep them under the rug because that's when they actually lead to very negative consequences. We will end on that very positive note. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you to our distinguished panel. Steve